When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hezekiah knows this. He knows that God is with him. That's what he's telling his people, and they, they are believing him. But as we go back to the, the second half of Hezekiah's reign, at least what we have in Scripture, back to 2 Kings chapter 18, the political problems are brewing all around. By the time you're back here, Hezekiah, king of Judah, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, he's besieging Samaria up north, and he's conquering Israel. It's happening right, just all around him, right north of him. The northern tribes are then scattered to the four winds. And what's next? I said Assyria is going to come up and over the Fertile Crescent. It's going to hit northern Israel first and then throughout Israel second and then down to Judah third as it's trying to get its way to Egypt to conquer everything. Now here in 2 Kings 18, we're in Hezekiah's fourth year of rule. So the temple has been solid for a, for, a, for a few years now. The Passover took place, and I'm sure they're celebrating it correctly year by year after that. Now, Hezekiah became king at age 25. So now he's 29. And imagine having a world superpower bearing down upon you as a 29-year-old. Young. It's only a kingdom away, just miles and miles to the north. And this goes on for 10 years. For 10 years, there's this concern and the north is being conquered and being scattered and we're just trying to hunker down and stay safe down here. No wonder he's stopping the fountains outside. No wonder he's working on the walls and the fortifications. We have to be ready spiritually and physically because Assyria is on its way. In verse 13 and 14 of 2 Kings 18, Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib king of Assyria come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them? Uh-oh, he's starting to succeed in the southern kingdom also. What's the king going to do? Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended, return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. In other words, I am sorry if I've done anything to offend you. Uh, I just want to maintain the peace of my people, to keep my kingdom for their sake, not for mine. And so what do you want us to do? He does that when the king is at Lachish. This is actually interesting because there's a series of broken pottery shards that are called the Lachish letters. It happens during the conquest of Judah during the reign of, during the Babylonians, not during the Assyrians. But it comes from Lachish also. I mean, if you're coming in to Jerusalem, you're going to kind of come up the hills from the west. And Lachish is one of these other cities that's a little further away, but it's on the way to Jerusalem. If you're going to conquer Jerusalem, you're typically going to conquer Lachish first. And in the Lachish letters... It's these Israelite or Judah general, these Jewish generals writing to one another, scared to death, like the, the Babylonians are coming and I can see the smoke in the distance and, and we're next and it's going to fall. Uh, the same kind of thing is happening here with the Assyrian conquest. But Hezekiah is trying to be humble as well as faithful. What would you have us do, almighty king of Assyria? Well, King Sennacherib makes some demands, but they are so above and beyond, exorbitant demands of Hezekiah. But Hezekiah does all he can to, to pay them, even to the point of removing silver and gold from the temple. Now, we've seen that done in the past. I think Hezekiah's heart was in a better place. He's trying to protect his people. He's the iconoclast, right? And if the, if, if the brazen serpent is just a chunk of metal, it's just Nahushtan, then what's the gold and silver of the temple when you really think about it? That's, don't mistake the box, the ark, for the covenant. Don't mistake the house of God for God. And so if it's just the silver and gold that have to go, if we can at least preserve the sanctity of the sanctuary. I mean, God was okay with a tent in the wilderness for 40 years. I think he'd be okay uh, with, with a 
a temple for a time that isn't quite cedar and gold. Let's try to keep the cedar at least. So he pays, he pays King Sennacherib. But as we've seen in the past, the wicked world is never satisfied with our appeasements. And so even with all that tribute, the Assyrian king still plans to attack Judah. We're conquering all the way up to Lachish, after all. And just Jerusalem's up the hill. Let's keep going. He sends an army up to Jerusalem to make a verbal confrontation first. Let's talk some smack, and maybe they'll just surrender. After all, we seem to be an innumerable host. And if we can just kind of plant seeds of doubt or fear, then people will, will give up themselves. That's usually the take in terms of anti-Mormonism. When it comes to matters of faith, I can't prove it right, but you can't prove it wrong. And so we're left with rhetoric, which is why I study anti-religious rhetoric all the time. What can I say to you in such a way that I make you feel certain things and think certain things where you choose to surrender on your own? I can't force the issue. That, again, it's like being besieged. I can't force you to surrender, but I can starve you out. I can tell you that you're cut off from all the great things we've got out here in this wicked world. And in this case, I can talk some smack. I can mock and laugh and point and scorn. All those things that they did from the Great and Spacious Building. Do you notice that? The Great and Spacious Building can't do a frontal attack on the Tree of Life. But from across the river, they can ridicule you. And that's typically the approach. In this one, it's part ridicule and part, part anger. A general named Rabshaka, who's one of the king's right-hand men, he comes and starts taunting the officials of Hezekiah. In verse 19, Rabshaka said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, which is the king of Assyria. Yours is kind of a mediocre monarchy at best. The great king, the king of Assyria, says this, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? And the word that kept coming up there, trust and trust and confidence, that's the essential question here. Where are you going to place your trust when you feel surrounded by a wicked world? Where is your confidence and where does it come from? Are you going to seek alliances with Egypt like your friends did up north? You're going to trust in your gods? Because, yeah, that hasn't worked out well for the other nations that we've already conquered. So you're going to trust in the arm of flesh? I'm not seeing much in there. So uh, why on earth would you trust a king that keeps telling you that, oh, I've got enough counsel, I've got enough strength for a war, because you don't. You're not omniscient. You have no counsel. You are not omnipotent. You have no strength. We've got way more of both of those than you do. So just give in, just surrender. In verse 21, he goes on, Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. Again, they're mocking what happened up north in Israel. They trusted in Egypt, and Egypt could not save them. So don't do the same thing. This is a bruised reed. If you've ever used like a walking stick and you have to lean on it, or picture a crutch, Picture a, cru a, a crutch that's made out of a, like a, a cattail and that the stem is already bruised and bent. It's just going to collapse under your weight. Uh, it, in fact, it's gonna, you rest your hand on it. It's just going to go through your hand and pierce you. It will only cause you pain, not help. Verse 22, if looking southwest to Egypt wasn't your strategy, then I hope it's not looking upward to God. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God... Uh, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? In other words, better not trust in God because I, I don't think he lives there anymore. Didn't Hezekiah like banish him when he smashed all that stuff? We got an iconoclast on the throne. And I, I don't think your God has felt welcome. I mean, no brazen serpent. To whom will you look and live? I guess they didn't understand why Hezekiah was doing that. No, God feels alive and well in Judah, in Jerusalem. It's his home, it's his home base. The temple is, has been rededicated. Verse 23, Rabshaka goes on. And again, it's taunting, smack-talking the whole way. Now, therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my lord, the king of Assyria. 
Just promise that you'll follow him. And I will deliver thee oh, 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. Like, do you even have enough men? If I provided the horses for the cavalry, could you provide the troops? Doubt it. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? You couldn't even handle little old me. What, are you going to put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? This is psychological warfare at its best. This is anti-religious rhetoric at its finest. Let me mock. Let me, let me taunt. Let me instill some fear. Let me plant some doubt. And let's see where it goes. Verse 25, he continues, And now am I come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? <laughs> no, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Oh, the God of Israel. I think he's actually on my side now. Oh yeah, let's put it that way. You, you think I'd came up without him? No, he's actually on my side. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he's the one that inspired me to come and destroy you. Now, there actually might be some truth to that, ironically, based on some things that Isaiah says about God using Assyria as the rod of his, of his wrath, uh, the rod of his indignation. That's a better word. Uh, I'm indignant, righteously so. And I'm going to use that to sweep off Israel and scatter them to the winds where I hope they'll turn to me so I can return them to, to God or to, to the promised land. So yeah, they may, may actually be right here. On the other hand, he might just be taunting. Oh, we got everything on our side. We got the forces on our side. We even have your God on our side. So yeah, don't cry to him. That's the big thing. Don't turn to your God. Well, Hezekiah's officials are really concerned about the effectiveness of Rabshakeh's rhetoric. So they beg him, please, you can go on, go on and keep taunting and talking smack. We can't stop you from that. But Will you please do it in your language instead of ours? Because, hey, we're the officials. We're better educated. We're fluent in your language. So if you'll taunt us in the Assyrian tongue, we'll still hear and we'll be able to take the message to the king. Now, what are they really after? It's not that we speak the Assyrian language. It's that you speak Hebrew. And uh, it's not just that we can understand you. It's... It's that our people can understand you right now. And I have a feeling they're probably getting scared to death. The Chronicles account makes Rabshakeh's strategy clear. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech, so in the Hebrew language, unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall, so these common soldiers, to affright them and to trouble them that they might take the city. This is psychological warfare at its finest. This is... Oh, airdropping leaflets of propaganda over enemy lines to scare the troops over on that side or scare the citizens so that they'll beg their leaders to surrender. We're about to destroy all of you. Just let us in and we'll take, the, take your, your kingdom in peace. It makes sense why Hezekiah's advisors would try to shield the people from that kind of propaganda. I think through much of our history, the church has tried to do similar things and we've been able to control the narrative but that day has passed. Uh, with the internet, with social media, with so many people posting and blogging and everything else, oh, it's hard to protect our children from the lies of our enemies or even the half-truths of former Latter-day Saints. And it's a hard thing to navigate. It's what I spend my life trying to help people navigate. And so I don't blame these advisors for trying. On the other hand, they underestimated their people because they underestimated their king. Keep reading and watch what happens. Verse 29, the, the taunting continues. In fact, it intensifies. Rabshakeh is yelling even louder than before. He's becoming more crass and coarse. And he sticks with Hebrew to make sure everybody understands him. Let not Hezekiah deceive you. I mean, he's the one deceiving you. He's the one gaslighting. He's the one telling you lies to keep you in subjection. No, no, we're the ones with the truth. We're the ones that are telling you everything you need to know. Oh, no, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. For he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. No, your faith is just wishful thinking. I've got an army here, 
and no other civilization has been able to stand up against it. You certainly won't. So please do not hold on to these flimsy excuses you call faith. There's nothing to it. Trust me, don't trust your king, and certainly don't trust your God the way the king is encouraging you. After all, verse 33, hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, Eva? Have they delivered Samaria out of the, mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? You see what Rabshak is doing there? He's just checking off the list. This civilization with this God defeated. This, civil, this kingdom with this God defeated. And we're undefeated which means every kingdom out there and every god that was supposed to protect them have been powerless against the might of Assyria. What makes you think your god will be any different? In fact, I have proof that your god can't be any different because don't those Israelites up in Samaria, don't they have the same god as you? Yeah, you guys like share your deity for some weird reason. Uh, yeah, the god of Israel did not spare Israel. You really think the god of Israel is going to spare Judah? Don't think it for a moment. Verse 36, But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. That's why I think that the advisors underestimated the troops. All those common privates up there on the wall, our children, our youth, our new converts, I'm not saying throw them out the wall and go take on the Assyrians <laughs> mano a mano. No, stay here within safety with prophets on the, watch on the watchtowers looking over us all. Stay here with the armor of God and the shield of faith. But I'm, I'm not shy about people hearing a full story or both sides of an issue because... God is God, and truth is truth. And, and the gospel of Jesus Christ can handle it. The truth of God will go forth nobly, boldly, and independent, despite the calumny and contention of a wicked world. Bank on that. And so hold your peace. Answer him not. There may be times where you have to answer. And the, the officials tried to answer, and Hezekiah is going to have a response of his own. Oh, God's going to have the ultimate response. We'll see it in just a moment. But there are times where it's simply best to hold your peace. Let them shout. Let them taunt. Let them say what they will. Turn the other cheek or turn the other ear, but answer them not. Try to hold the higher moral ground and don't descend into contention. Believe me, I've been taunted and invited, or challenged is a better term. I've had the gauntlet thrown down before me saying, no, come on our show and let's debate this issue. And I simply respond, yeah, I'm not interested in a contentious kind of conversation, but if you ever wanted to have lunch, I'd love to come to meet you and hear your story because... You're a human being, that a brother or sister that I value, and I'd love to get to know you better. I'd love to hear where you're coming from so I can validate the positions that I can and empathize wherever I'm able and, and actually prove your contrary with mine and help us both see that the other side has a leg to stand on. And, and we can come together on these things. It typically, in those cases, it's, yeah, answer him not on those kinds of issues. I'll just sit back and be still and know that God is God. Or I'll sit back and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which is what happens next. Chapter 19, guess who comes onto the scene? Hold out for it. Hezekiah's officials run to him with their clothing torn, their sign of mourning. We're up against an enemy that's innumerable. They tell Hezekiah all that Rabshakeh has said. And in verse 1, it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, he rent his clothes also. He covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. His immediate response was humility, was repentance, 
was getting as close to God as he could in his holy house. In verse 2, he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth too, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Ah, the real cavalry has arrived. Oh, this is Gandalf the White replacing Gandalf the Grey. This is the, the Rohirrim roaring down the mountain uh, to come to the rescue at the Battle of, of Helm's Deep, uh, if you're Tolkien fans at all. Uh, this is Isaiah coming to the rescue. Again, what does Hezekiah do in his times of need or doubt or fear? Turn to the Lord and his prophets. In verse 3, these advisors say to Isaiah, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble, of rebuke, of blasphemy, for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. Now, I understand the trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. That's Rabshakeh personified, but what's this with a birth? In essence, they're saying to Isaiah, they're using metaphorical language. They're probably used to listening to Isaiah, and it's like, he never says anything like straightforwardly. It's always poetic and symbolic, so we better do the same thing. Um, it, it, there's a childbirth uh, happening, and we don't have a midwife. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Does that work for you? Uh, we need this, we're in the moment of life-threatening labor, and we need all the help that we can get. So if you could come and deliver... The baby, deliver us. Are you following me here? And I picture Isaiah going, nice try, guys. But yeah, I get it. I get, I'll come. <laughs> In verse 4, they say, It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. This is a testimony of sorts on the part of these advisors. Uh, it may be, at least I'm hoping, this as much faith as I can muster right now, maybe God overheard what Rob Shaka was doing, that blasphemy I just mentioned, and he will rebuke them. He'll reproach them because they reproached him. But will you please come and pray for the remnant that are left? And if there's anybody who knows something about remnants, it's a guy who named his son Sheer Yashuv, which means a remnant shall return. Will you come and pray for the remnant? Oh, of course. I mean, I'm raising one back home. That's Isaiah for you. And so Isaiah comes running. In fact, in verse 6, he responds to them, Thus shall ye say to your master. Uh, you, you're probably going to sprint back. I might be a little slower. But tell him this. Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Because that's all they are. They're just words. Don't let them affect you. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. This is like that noise, quote-unquote, that the Syrians heard when they were besieging Samaria. Remember that story when the four lepers go out and the whole camp is deserted? Like, don't want, we won the lottery that day, that idea. It was just a noise. But they took it seriously and ran. Well, this is just going to be a rumor we talk about wars and rumors of wars. Well, here's going to be a rumor, but the Assyrians will hear it and will retreat. So don't worry about the words of Rabshaka, because that's all they were. It's interesting the way that this verse focuses on words. Isaiah knew their power. That's why he, he painted word portraits with such beauty and imagery and poetry. It's amazing what words can do. There is persuasive power there. No wonder one of the Lord's nicknames is the Word of God. And ironically, the Assyrians that up till now are just using words against us will be defeated by words against them. So rest assured, don't be afraid, Hezekiah. Well, miraculously, that's exactly what happens. Rabshakeh returns to King Sennacherib and they hear a report is it a report or is it just a rumor? Well, I guess we'll have to, to see. That the Ethiopians are planning an attack on the Assyrians. You see, that's the hard part about running an entire empire. How do you keep the peace everywhere? Or you, you're so big, you now have enemies from every angle. And we're not even to Egypt yet. And already the Ethiopians are planning some attack. And they're a lot stronger than these... <laughs> piddly Israelites in the kingdom of Judah. I mean, and it's easy enough. We just basically have the capital left. We've conquered Lachish and a lot of the other cities. So let's put this attack on hold 
and go make sure we can handle the Ethiopians when they're on their way. So Isaiah was right. It was as simple as that. Well, not entirely, because this is going to buy Hezekiah some time, but it doesn't completely scare off the Assyrian army. Up to this point, it's simply the noise, the rumor, they won't come. So just stand still and see the salvation of God. But once they leave, no standing still. we got some work to do. And just in case Hezekiah thinks that this is over, the Rabbishakah sends one more letter. Uh, he doesn't have the time to keep yelling in Hebrew behind his, over his shoulder. But he does send a letter back to Hezekiah that repeats all the smack talk he gave to the people on the wall. Kinds of things like, don't trust in Egypt, don't trust in any gods, especially your measly God who couldn't even help the Israelites. There has been no God that's been able to stand up before us in the past. So now Hezekiah has that taunting thrown right in his face. How's he going to respond? Look at verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. This seems to be how Hezekiah responds to difficulty and trial and attack and everything else. He calmly goes to God and turns things over to him. In this case, in fact, he spreads it out before him. And I love the mental image of this. I've got this letter, maybe written on a scroll, and he takes it to the temple and he unrolls it. He opens it up, basically saying, Father in heaven, this is what I'm up against. I want you to be able to see every line, every blasphemous word. This is the situation I find myself in. And are you aware of where I'm at? What, can you give me counsel on what to do? Instead of being vague and just saying, Father, bless me, or the one word prayer, help. If we were more intentional and went to God, at his house is a, a, a wonderful place to do it, but metaphorically laid out, spread out before God our problems. And this is everything that I'm going through. And this is how I feel about it. And this is what I've tried to do in the past to get through it, but I'm still struggling and I could really use some guidance. There's power in spreading out our problems to the Lord. He sees it already, but for us to expose it all to him, to open the doors, as we said before. In verse 15, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. And notice what he prays. O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubim. I know you're not the cherubim. I know you're not the ark. I know you're an agent, not an object, but that is your throne. And I know you sit there overlooking Israel. Thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Oh, ears to hear, eyes to see, sound like Moses. As God says to him, I've heard their cries, I've seen the affliction, I'm sending you to deliver them. Sound like Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. How long, O oh Lord, will thy eye see and thy ear be pierced with our cries? Please come and save us. Hezekiah is offering a similar prayer, but notice the focus throughout. It's on thee. Thou art the God. Thou alone, you're the only one. You created heaven and earth. You're the only God there is. And so that puts into perspective the taunting of Rabshaka about these, this tally of, of defeated deities. They're not gods at all. It's what Hezekiah says next in his prayer. Verse 17, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. There's no denying that. They have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have d destroyed them. Of course they couldn't deliver the people. Wood and stone never can. But thee? Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. This is pure monotheism, surrounded by polytheism on every side. There's only one God, and he hasn't defeated him yet. 
And don't bring up Israel because the God of Israel couldn't preserve the Israelites because they weren't claiming him as their God. But we do. Do you have any idea what we've been doing for the last decade plus? Preparing ourselves spiritually first and foremost so God could be with us and then under his guidance and direction preparing ourselves physically as best we possibly can. We're ready for this. We're ready for Assyria because God is ready for him. In verse 20, even while Hezekiah is praying in the temple, then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, I have heard. Isaiah is delivering the answer even though he wasn't there for the question. It's amazing what prophecy can make possible. Verse 21 to 28, then, is the Lord's message for Assyria. And it's going to come from Isaiah, so buckle up. It's a bit confusing. And one of the things that makes it hard is it's tough to tell who's speaking in each verse. So I'll try to walk you through it. Verse 21, we start clearly. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him. So through Isaiah, God is speaking to the king of Assyria. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Now, this is <laughs> fighting fire with fire or talking smack to those who talked smack. Remember, Rob Shaka, you're nothing. I mean, we could even give you horses and you wouldn't have enough troops to be able to ride upon them and we'd still be able to beat you. Well, here, <laughs> the Lord is... There's a little Elijah here in Isaiah, apparently, uh, and he's willing to throw a little mockery back in the face of the king of Assyria because he's gendering Israel female, first of all. Now, he does that often in the book of Isaiah in magnificent ways because there are things about the power of women and the love of mothers, for example, that is absolutely breathtaking. Can't, pick, can't think of a better metaphor for the love of God than the love of a mother. But here, at least as I see it, the gendering Israel female and in fact making it a young girl. She's a virgin. She's a daughter. And what is this young, innocent maiden doing? <laughs> laughing at you, despising you, laughing you to scorn, shaking her head like, <laughs> I'm supposed to be scared of you? I mean, it's one thing for little kids on the playground to say, my dad can beat up your dad, or my, my big brother can defend me. It's another thing to say, my baby sister could show you up. That's some good smack talk. And this is how it all begins. Go on in verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Well, let me answer my own question. Even against the Holy One of Israel. Do you have any idea who you are messing with? Because it's not just a little girl across the wall from you. It's the God of Israel looking down. In verse 23, By thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord, and hast said... So now right here, if we were doing modern punctuation, you'd put a comma and a, a quotation mark. So this is what the Assyrians are saying. With the multitude of my chariots, I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the side of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the lodgings of his borders, and into the forests of his Carmel. That's just Assyrian pride talking. They're the ones that think... Oh, we're higher than the mountains of Israel. We're higher than the forests, the cedars of Lebanon. Nothing can stand in our way. Are you kidding? Do you know who you're messing with? My baby sister can beat you. Keep going. Verse 24. And this is still Assyrian pride speaking. I have digged and drunk strange waters. With the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places. Again, in our past, through our conquests, no one has been able to stand up to us. Uh, even you, pesky, puny Hezekiah, that's tried to stop up the springs outside of the walls. Oh, others have tried that. And yet, what are we able to do? We can dig and drink strange waters, foreign waters. We're in foreign territory. We don't know the, the lay of the land. We don't know the manner of the gods of the land. It doesn't matter. We can dig our own wells. We can take care of ourselves, thank you very much. And so nothing's going to be able to stand up or stop us. Or the flip side, with the sole of my feet, I've dried up the rivers of besieged places. Oh, you can't stop us from finding water to drink, but we sure can stop you. I dare you. Just try. 
Well, God's willing to take the dare. Verse 25 to 28 are now the Lord's response to Sennacherib. Again, if we can pay attention to the speaker in each verse, then this prophecy makes sense. So here's the Lord, verse 25. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? And of ancient times that I have formed it. Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldst be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps? Oh, I am behind all of this. In fact, even all these other places that you've conquered, that wasn't you. That was me. Again, Isaiah will make a big point of this in chapter 7 and chapter 10, that Assyria is just a tool in my hand. And so your victories were not because of your strength, but because of my righteous indignation upon people that should have known better. Do not be the axe that boasteth itself. Do not be the axe that boasteth itself against the hewer. Because I'm the one that's, that's holding the tool. After all, verse 26, their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. All those other kingdoms that you conquered, they were nothing. A small power. This is kind of like when the king of Israel was telling King Amaziah, you beat the Edomites for crying out loud. The JV squad, no big deal. If you can't beat the Edomites, you can't beat anybody. It's like taking on the Sacramento Kings in the NBA. Had to throw that in for my in-laws that are Sacramento Kings fans. Anyway, they were nothing. So of course you beat them, especially when it's my power that's helping you. You're not going to beat my people, though, because I'm on their side, not on yours. God goes on in verse 27 and 8. I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. I know everything about the Assyrian Empire. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. Now, we started with smack talk. There's ending with smack talk. Because guess what the Assyrian army was famous for in terms of conquering people? And, I mean, scattering them, yes, but also dragging some back to show the Assyrian king, look at what we've done. There's even like inscriptions that show this. They would often put hooks into the noses. Picture a nose ring and then put a chain to it. And we're going to drag you back home by the nose. If that doesn't work, we can put a hook through your lip and drag you home that way. Just the soft tissue. It's going to hurt. So you better keep up. It's interesting here that the Lord takes that and throws it right back in their face. You're the one that's going to be carried captive. I'm going to drag you back home to where you came from. And I'll do it in your way. Let's see how you feel. This is enforced empathy like we've seen earlier. You'll know what it feels like to have a hook in the nose and a bridle in the lip. Well, from that part then, still God is speaking, but now he shifts his audience to Hezekiah. You see why it's so tricky? You've got to kind of label, <laughs> have some, some show notes and, and cue cards. Okay, now God is speaking to Hezekiah. And that's verse... Uh, 29 to 34. In 29, this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such thing as grow of themselves. In the second year, that which springeth of the same. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. So here's the game plan. Let me prophesy a bit for you, mighty King Hezekiah. Uh, Since you don't know what's coming, I do. This first year, because I know if it's you're under siege and the enemy is coming and you haven't been able to go out and plant crops, You certainly don't want to grow food for somebody else to eat anyway. No worries. This year, there's enough in store. There there was a bountiful harvest. I see the end from the beginning. There's enough to eat this year. In fact, there's enough to eat next year. And two years of letting the land lie fallow, kind of a Sabbath sabbatical for it. That's good. Uh, Letting your people not worry so much about agriculture. Believe me, they'll have other things to worry about. There'll be walls to build and tunnels to dig and fortifications to erect. So this is, this is good for everybody. And by the third year, you'll be fine. You can go back out and replant. Uh, so nobody's going to starve. Don't worry about any kind of siege warfare. He goes on in verse 30. And the remnant, there's that Sheer Yashub word, the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. 
and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. And again, if you don't believe me, I named my son after it to make it crystal clear how confident I am in God's promise. Sheir Yashub, come, visual aid. <laughs> Show King Hezekiah that a remnant shall return. In fact, more than return, its roots will go downward. Its fruit will come upward. Sound like the family tree that Malachi talked about? And hearts turning from fathers to children, from roots to branches and branches to roots. It's going to be okay. God will keep his family tree intact. In verse 32, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. And this one's even bigger than the first one. First one, oh, there'll be some rumor and they'll leave for a time. How about this? He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. Wait, what? He hasn't come all this way just to taunt us and then run. Not even cast up a bank? To kind of hunker down behind and wait out the, our counterattacks? Not even shoot an arrow? What? He's going to at least do that, right? even on his way out, you know, just some fire a few departing shots. Believe me, the way Rob Shaka talks smack, he's not going to be able to help himself. Well, trust me, this impossible promise comes from God, so not a single arrow. Verse 33, by the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Zion is in my hands. It's my city. I will defend it. I will save it. So stand still and watch the salvation of God. In verse 35, it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out, and this was not a ministering angel, this was a destroying angel, and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. 185,000 troops. When they arose early in the morning, the survivors, behold, they were all dead corpses, their comrades in arms. What just happened? Well, I told you that Hezekiah was the second Moses. I told you that Passover saved them from Egypt the first time, and Passover would save them from Assyria the second. Oh, no one outside the walls was prepared. And the destroying angel did not pass over them. Instead, it destroyed 185,000. How are you going to respond to that? Well, alarmed by such massive losses in his army, Sennacherib does exactly as Isaiah had prophesied. He turns tail and runs. And doesn't worry about the Ethiopians, doesn't worry about the, the, the people of Judah. He sprints straight back home to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. But what happens to him there? He goes into the temple of the Assyrian god. I mean, mightiest God on earth, since it's beat all these other minor gods. But there in the temple of the Assyrian deity, two of Sennacherib's own sons come in and kill him. How's that for conspiracy? How's that for your God protecting you? Yeah, not so much. He's going to do the same thing against your army. This God of Assyria could not protect the king nor the army Whereas the God of Israel is doing what? Protecting the king, protecting the army, protecting his people. Uh, it's amazing to see what's happening. God versus God. Or God versus non-God in this case. With that victory, without even having to fight, and sure enough, not even a single arrow was, was shot, turn to chapter 20 and we see a fast forwarding. And Hezekiah is later in life, he is sick, and Isaiah tells him to put his house in order because this is sickness unto death. You're not going to survive. But Hezekiah prays, and we've seen the kind of spiritual giant Hezekiah was. We've seen the power of his prayers. He prays in verse 3, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Now, is that going to change anything? He was just told by a prophet of God that you're going to die. And that prophet has a really good track record. I mean, he just, earlier in the previous chapter, he prophesied the impossible and it happened. 
and the Assyrian army just took off and ran. I mean, the way the story ends at the end of chapter 19 is so understated, it's almost like, wait, wait, is that it? It's like, yeah, that's it. Move on. Just live your life. It's like God isn't trumpeting his victories. It's like, okay, they went home and the king died and they were killed by his sons. And okay, next. What's the next thing that has to happen? Uh, Judah, you're safe for the next century plus. Uh, so how are you going to live your life? Are you going to stay faithful? Are you going to still, st still be strong? That's what the chapters ahead are going to, the, the tale they're going to tell. But here, it's still Hezekiah, and he's at the end of his rope, end of his life, literally. And God, do you ever change your mind? Uh, I've tried really hard, and I'm just hoping that you can balance my future against my past. Not all of us would want that to happen, by the way. Can you forget my past and just give me a better future? But here, Hezekiah, I've tried my whole life to follow you with a perfect heart. And if that's worth anything, I've been banking my life on your law for as long as I've lived. Can I live a little longer? I'll stay faithful, I promise. There's an amazing book by Elder John H. Groberg about his mission in Tonga as a young man. It's, it was called In the Eye of the Storm. It was turned into a movie that was called The Other Side of Heaven. It's a beautiful movie. And the director of that movie was a man named Mitch Davis. He gave a talk at BYU with Elder and Sister Groberg, uh, remember, remember the 70, uh, when that movie first came out, to tell some mission stories and so on. And the movie is about Elder Groberg's mission, but Mitch Davis told a story about his. Not as a missionary, but in the aftermath of his mission. He said, and this is mind-blowing, he was on a, a hike with his son and a friend and the family dog, these boys were young, but they were out on a mountain and a storm, a freak storm blew in and lightning everywhere and, and they hunkered down for shelter and just hoped. But a lightning bolt came tearing through the tent. It struck the dog and killed it instantly. And it seemed to have killed Mitch Davis as well. He said he could feel life leaving. He could feel his spirit separating from his body and he was thinking about his son and this friend thinking there's no way they're going to be able to make it down the mountain. I've got to live so that they can. I... But he wondered, can I even ask for a miracle like that? I was part of this lightning strike and my life is over. And in the midst of that traumatic moment, he felt the Spirit whisper to him, you served a valiant mission. Ask in confidence. <laughs> he didn't even have the guts to ask. It was like, I, I want to. I want to live. But who am I to change the will of God? I was struck by lightning and it's over. But for God to give him that reassurance, based on the life he'd lived as a missionary, Mitch Davis said, I was no amazing thing. That's why the movie was about Elder Groberg's mission and not my own. <laughs> but I guess it was valiant enough. And God weighed my future against my past and honored the intent of my heart. He let me ask and he encouraged me to ask in confidence. So I did. Let me live. And he did. He led his son and this, his friend down the mountain. He even carried the, the body of the family dog. It's an amazing story if you want to look it up and read it on uh, the BYU Speeches site. But that's what is happening with Hezekiah here. I've lived a valiant life, and I'm going to ask in confidence. And miraculously, God does change his mind. Isaiah's leaving, but the Lord tells him in verse 5 and 6, Turn again, go back, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Notice he calls him the captain, not the king, which is, makes sense since God is the king of kings, and Hezekiah knows it too, so you know, oh, I'll just be your captain. So go tell the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, your favorite spot, and I will add unto thy days 15 years. Will that be enough for you, King Hezekiah? It's amazing how generous God is being here with life itself. 
especially since he just told Isaiah, yeah, King Hezekiah, this is a sickness unto death. Wait, did, did God just change his mind? I mean, this is a theological question worth wrestling with. Does God change his mind? Better said, does God change his will? Better asked, does God change his will based on the faith and prayers of his children? This passage would say yes. In fact, the concept of prayer in general would say yes. I mean, yes, prayer is also meant to allow us to, to submit our will to the will of the Father. But that suggests that we have a will to submit. If we're going to lay it on the altar, we better have something to lay there. This is what I want, what I'm hoping for, what I'm praying for. If it's not thy will, then thy will be done. But if there's any wiggle room, I sure would like my will to be honored. And God, in his wisdom, I wonder if sometimes he just wants to know how much do we want something. He still may say no. And that's where his wisdom uh, is better than ours. His way is higher than ours. But there may be times where you re really, you don't care about your will at all. You, you're just, you, almost to the point of over-submission. There's, I guess, a Goldilocks zone in there too. Prove these contraries. Have a will and submit it. That was Elder Maxwell's challenge when he was diagnosed with leukemia. And he said to his wife, well, I've been preaching about submitting to the will of God my whole life. I guess God called me on it. Uh, I better uh, practice what I preached and just let I just die. And Sister Maxwell was like, honey, no. I mean, when the day comes, yes, accept it humbly, but fight it till then. And he did. And God gave him a, a stay and route, a reprieve for a time, which I'm so grateful for. It's actually one of the great things about praying and fasting and giving priesthood blessings to people because it shows God just how much we want something. It proves to him the depth of our desire, the strength of our will. And if it goes differently, if the outcome is not what we've been pleading for, then that's better evidence than anything that God's will truly was done. Because we gave God every opportunity to do things our way. I hope that gives us a certain sense of of resignation and uh, recognition that things are okay and that we can be submissive to the will of God once it's completely manifest. In this case, God was, okay, you want it? It's yours. Now, Isaiah is then inspired to know what to do to heal Hezekiah's illness. And then he, God even gives him a sign that I will lengthen Hezekiah's days. And the sign would be this, Go out and look at the sundial, and the shadow on the sundial will turn back 10 degrees. Because I'm turning back the clock and giving you an extra 15 years. In a way, that's what he'd just done for all of Israel. I, I bought you an extra century plus because of the faithfulness of, Hez of Hezekiah. Now, you were about to be destroyed because of the wickedness of your ancestors, and you turned it all around. And your righteousness brought an extra century for your people. I guess the least I can do is give you an extra 10 degrees on the sundial, an extra 15 years of life. This really is an amazing miracle. But it's not the only thing that's happening on, with Hezekiah at this moment. In verse 13, we're going to see something really important here. You see, the king of Babylon has sent letters and gifts to Hezekiah because he'd heard that the king was sick. Now, wait a minute. King of Babylon? I thought we were talking about the Assyrian Empire. How long did Hezekiah live for crying out loud? Well, here's where we need to understand. It's not like every day, I mean, every, I mean, everybody is Assyrian one day, and then the next day, everybody wakes up Babylonian all of a sudden. No, the, there's overlaps here. The end of the Greek Empire and the beginning of the Roman Empire weren't like day one followed by day two. There was an overlap, and they coexisted for quite some time. It's just Greece was stronger than Rome, and then Greece waned, and Rome waxed, and, and there was a replacement. Same thing with the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. Uh, we just haven't quite hit the, the hinge point yet. So this other king, Babylonian, sends letters and gifts. And ah, sorry that things are... 
in some ways, maybe it's, well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and I hate the Assyrians. I want to take over for them. And somehow Hezekiah is like the lone holdout. I don't know how on earth he conquered, he beat the Assyrians and killed 185,000 troops. This is a good king to have on my good side. So let's go uh, send some gifts. But then notice this in verse 13. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, these messengers that brought the letters and gifts, and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, all the house of his armor, all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Now, on the one hand, you'd think, oh, yeah, you were nice to me. You brought gifts. Hey, you want a tour of the kingdom? Uh, I know just the right spot in the royal treasury to put these incredible gifts. But while I'm at it, you should see just how blessed our kingdom has been. I mean, you're probably scratching your head and wondering, I mean, how did we beat the Assyrians? Well, God has blessed us and he's blessed us abundantly. So let me show you the whole thing. Now that was, maybe this is one of the things, maybe this is a strength that becomes a weakness. Maybe one of the reasons that Hezekiah was such a good king is he was a trusting individual and he totally trusted God. He trusted his his Levites and his priests. He trusted the people that would come down from, from the northern kingdom. He, he just trusted in the goodness of, and compassion and mercy and grace of God. And he was completely justified in all that trust. But being a trusting person, he also trusted in some people that weren't very trustworthy. And yeah, that's the flip side of that coin. Joseph Smith was the same way, by the way. Totally trusted God. And totally trusted some... <laughs> non-trustworthy people. Uh, he just gave people the benefit of the doubt to a fault. And Hezekiah seems to be made cut from the same cloth. Well, the mistake here was Babylonians aren't trying to be your best friends. They want to conquer the world even more than the Assyrians did, which would include your kingdom. So guess what they're doing with their gifts? Talk about strings attached. Yeah, where do they put gifts? What are the gifts do they have? What is the lay of the land? Spy it out for me, will you? And guess who sees through that? Isaiah does. And so when Isaiah find out, finds out what happened, he realizes the problem. It's like, you, let, you gave the thieves a tour of your home? Ah. Verse 16, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day. In other words, everything you've shown to the Babylonians shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. This is a prophecy of the Babylonian captivity. And Isaiah has a pretty good track record on prophecies fulfilled. You opened your doors to the enemy and they will drag you out of those doors along with all the stuff that you showed them. Now, yes, I turn back the clock for you and I turn back the clock for your people against the Assyrians and I'll do it against the Babylonians too. But the day will come when Judah is conquered. It won't be on your watch, but it will come. This was not wise on your part. Well, how's Hezekiah going to respond? Jekyll or Hyde? Well, I haven't seen a Hyde moment, just the flip side of his strength. And sure enough, in verse 19, Hezekiah says to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? There's some good submission, some submissiveness on his part. He's proved that contrary really well. I'm going to push for my will. And can I live longer? But I realize, okay, I, I don't have a leg to stand on for push to push for my will on this. So I'm going to accept the good word of the good Lord. And I understand my mistake, and I'm sorry, but I, I'll accept what you've done. And, and I, in fact, I'll be grateful that at least in my days, that reprieve, there will be peace and truth here. Now, the book of Kings basically stops there with the story of Hezekiah. It gives us one more detail I'll bring up in just a moment. But in this moment of the Babylonian ambassadors, it's a confusing story. For some, it's not even a story at all. It's like, wait, he did what? Okay, that's weird. Okay, whatever. But there, speaking of theology, there's some theology here that's absolutely essential to understand. Especially if you've ever felt a time in your life where you can't seem to feel the Spirit, apparently through no fault of your own. Sometimes we don't feel the Spirit and we know it's our fault. Okay, I've sinned and I've alienated the, the Holy Ghost and I'm going to repent and invite him back. And he comes running. 
That's the mercy, compassion, grace of God. But what about times where I just can't feel anything? Elder Renlund gave a great talk about receptor sites. He is a doctor after all. And the, you might be the body might be filled with the things that the cells need, but if the receptor sites are blocked, it's not coming in. They're not getting what they need, even though it's available. He talked about sin being a blocker of spiritual receptor sites. He, he talked about mental illness as a blocker of spiritual receptor sites. And that's, I've seen that all too often, that when we're triggered and flooded with anxiety or we're just sapped of any f hope in depression or too many voices in our heads that are screaming for attention, it's really hard for the still small voice to be heard, even when God is speaking to you. But there's other times where, I don't know why, it's just a dark night of the soul. It's a time of doubt. I, I'm struggling. I don't know why. I'm doing everything that I used to do. I'm trying, but I just don't feel God with me. Mother Teresa suffered with that for decades. And many people of any faith, including ours, have wrestled with his absence as well. And that's why this next verse is my go-to verse in these, in these circumstances. It grows out of that experience from King Hezekiah. But maybe we don't know this verse because it's buried in 2 Chronicles instead of found in 2 Kings. But go with me to 2 Chronicles 32, and verse 31 is the verse. He's just relayed the story of these Babylonian ambassadors, and it says in verse 31, Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. I love those phrases. Hezekiah seemed to have been led by God almost uninterrupted. I mean, it helps to have Isaiah just down the hallway, right? Uh, but a man of such goodness and such perfect heartedness, rededicating temples, first thing, and everything that we've studied today. I love Hezekiah. He's one of my favorite kings of Judah. But in this moment, he wasn't guided by God. And no wonder he messed up. He was a little too trusting and either didn't ask God or God didn't say anything to him and thought, well, I mean, the Babylonians aren't attacking us and they brought a gift and so why not? And yeah, he made a mistake. It wasn't going to cost him or his people during his generation. And later kings were going to be the cause and the problems of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. But I love the, the passage, the phrase at the end. Theologically, here's the truth. There are times that God does leave us through no fault of our own. Jesus would say that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But to borrow this language, why did God leave Hezekiah in that moment? It's never permanent. To try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. When I taught my kids how to ride their bikes, I would run right alongside them with my hand on their shoulder or the back of their bike seat, just making sure they didn't fall. But there comes a time where you do have to leave them, where you take your hand off, partly to see if they're learning to balance and partly to see, will you keep pedaling on your own? Because I'm here to help you, but not to push and pull you the whole way. God is the same. And there are times where God is seeking to develop our own independence in a good way. Not the prideful independence that I don't want to be part of you and I don't have to listen to you. We've seen enough of that in Israel. But for those that are feeling lonely spiritually, feeling colorblind and you can no longer see the vivid hues that you're used to, if you feel like you're tone deaf and I can't seem to hear the song of redeeming love, but I want to, and I'm doing the same things that have always brought that chorus rushing in in the past. That's a verse I would encourage you to commit to memory and realize that there are times where God just wants to see what's in our heart. Keep pedaling. The light will come. You'll still, uh, someday again, hopefully soon, you'll feel the hand on your shoulder again. You'll sense that God 
has been running beside you the whole time, even if you haven't had the eyes to see. I'm grateful for that reality, and I pray that through the dark nights of our soul, we'll know that it's just passing cloud cover, and God wants to see what we'll do when we think we're on our own. Didn't Brigham Young say something about that? We have to learn to be righteous in the dark. Yeah, the light will come. One last thing here. Back in the King's account, chapter 20, verse 20, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, which sound like we're wrapping things up, we are, how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. And that's typically how things end. And sure enough, chapter 21, Hezekiah is gone, and his son is on the throne. And we need to meet Manasseh in chapter 21. But right here, can I say something really quick about what that verse just described? He made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. I told you that we were going to come back and talk about water with Hezekiah later on. The first instance was, there's water outside the city. And if the Assyrians come and lay siege, then I've just given them the drinking fountain. Well, that's not good. That's going to bless them at our expense. But there's a flip side to it. So yes, I can uh, kind of seal that over so the Assyrians will know what it feels like to be thirsty. The problem is there are no natural springs within the city wall of Jerusalem. Now that's a planning mistake. <laughs> we built the walls and it's like, great, we'll get some water. Oh, it's on the other side. Hmm, bummer which means every time you have to go out and get water, you have to leave the protection of your wall. What should we do? Hezekiah, again, is thinking outside the box. He's fortifying things. He's equipping his people. He's trying to get physically prepared after he'd gotten spiritually prepared. And this is where we get Hezekiah's tunnel. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, I hope you've walked through Hezekiah's tunnel. It's awesome because it feels like you're spelunking through this underwater river, because basically you are. What happens is there is this spring outside the wall. The closest water source to, Israel, to Jerusalem is the Gihon Spring. But like I said, it's outside the wall, so that's a problem. Uh, do we just extend the wall? That would have been smart, but that's a ton of work. Let's try something different. There is a pool inside the city wall. That's the Pool of Siloam. And what if we connected the two? In fact, the Gihon Spring is at a higher elevation than the Pool of Siloam. And so if we somehow like dug a tunnel underneath the city wall, then the water would flow downhill from the Gihon Spring to the Pool of Siloam and we'd have a water source inside the city. Perfect. We could even cap the top so the Assyrians can't get to it on the outside. And so that's how they do it. Uh, in the Chronicles version of this, you see it in chapter 32, verse 30, this same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon, keep it from the Assyrians, and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. And you would need to be prospered in this one because it's an engineering marvel for the ancient world. I mean, because here's how he did it. There's no GPS, there's no tr like tracking system underground, there's just these two spots, and how are we going to do this? It'd be one thing to go, well, just plot it out, and as the crow flies, let's make a straight shot between the two. But what, I mean, if you start at one and just kind of work your way to the other, do you know if you're straight and true underground it, for like a thousand feet plus? This is going to be hard. So what Hezekiah told his engineers to do was let's have one group start at the Gihon Spring and let's have another group start at the Pool of Siloam and dig toward each other and find each other. Good luck with that. It's a miracle that they did. But if you've walked Hezekiah's tunnel, there are times where the water's you're splashing through your ankles and there's times it's closer to your knees and it's a weaving, wandering, meandering little stream. Uh, it's not a straight shot. I love Hezekiah's tunnel because to me it becomes such a great metaphor for marriage. We have two people starting from two different points. And the, we just hope we'll find each other. And we're making compromises and we're trying. And in fact, there were etched, the, the archaeologists discovered that etched on the walls close to the midpoint were these little scratchings that basically said things like, I can hear them through the wall. They must be, we must be getting close. 
And sometimes that's the closest we feel in our relationships. It's like, I, I think I'm making sense to her. It, do I understand what she means by that? And it's, we're speaking through the limestone, trying, to become, trying for two be, to become one. It's a miracle that it ever happens. But it does. I would actually say that on the one hand, yes, it takes compromising and changing and being willing to turn and move and just meet in the middle somewhere. The other I would say is that if they're really, in the modern time, I'm sure it would be a straight shot. And if you still started in both locations, they would be given such a straight course or a central meeting spot that, hey, as long as I get to that spot and as long as the other team gets to that spot, I know we'll meet in the middle. That's actually the best form of marriage. You pick a central spot and come together. Now, you might think I'm talking proving contraries. It probably comes down to that. But I'm really talking about coming unto Christ. If he is that fixed spot and I come unto Christ and my wife comes unto Christ, then that's where we'll finally meet. And in fact, the closer we each come unto him, the closer we'll be. If you picture a triangle, husband on one corner and wife on the other, and Christ and the third, then the, the triangle shrinks the closer I come and the closer my wife comes to the Savior. That's even better engineering. It's good theology. If the ancients had done that, they would have shaved off nearly 700 feet. That's a lot of meandering. Okay. Well, we have to say goodbye to Hezekiah, which is sad because He's replaced by a son that is nothing like his father. Hezekiah was nothing like his father. He was righteous, but his son Manasseh was one of the worst of the worst, and that's tragic. It's interesting, if you look at the ages, he ascended to the throne at the age of 12. And if you do the math, he's only 12 years old when he replaces his father. So how long ago, what was Hezekiah doing when Manasseh was born? And what did Hezekiah's life look like during Manasseh's childhood? The spiritual preparation was long since past. And yes, you knowing Hezekiah would assume that he's still doing everything that he should. But he, Manasseh didn't see the beginning. He didn't see, he didn't know how bad things had become. He didn't see the consequences of, of wickedness personally. He only saw the consequences of righteousness and frankly, probably took them for granted. And now it's, I don't want to do it my dad's way. I want to do things different. And he reigns in absolute wickedness. And unfortunately, he lives a long time and his reign lasts 55 years. Plenty of time to reverse the righteousness of a reforming and restoring father. In verse 3 of 2 Kings 21, he built up again the high places, which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. Oh, seriously? That was like the one moment we didn't have high places, and now they're back. He reared up altars for Baal, made a grove, as did Ahab, king of Israel. Wait, he's going back to all those sins? Yep. He worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Manasseh is desecrating the very temple that his father worked so hard to sanctify. He's bringing in false altar altars to false gods there in the house of the true God of Israel. It's amazing how much time it can take to get things right and how long that can last and then how quickly they can all fall apart. My wife and son, as I've mentioned to you before, work in addiction recovery, and it's, no matter how long a recovery lasts, a, a fall back into former addictions might be just a drink away, might just be a, a fix away, and, and then with that one fix or one drink, it, it pulls you down and, want, and, you, and you want more and more and you get worse and worse, and that's what happens with Manasseh. It's a deepening of the original problems that happened before. In verse 6, for example, he made his son pass through the fire. Back to child sacrifice. He observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. There's the rejection of true prophets. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And if that wasn't bad enough, verse 7, he set a graven image of the grove that he had made 
in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. This seems like he's rubbing it in. Right there into the Lord's face, right where his name is centered, in his house. Let's make an image, since he said no graven images. Let's put the grove to replace the tree of life. And let's have it grow right in the face of God. Manasseh, oh, verse 9, he seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And how's that for foreshadowing? These are the very things that led to their destruction. What do you think they're going to do to you? Same thing. But verse 10, God's not given up on him. The Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying that because of Manasseh's wickedness, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Now, the last time we heard that phrase from the Lord was when he was referring to the, lo the loss of the Ark of the Covenant way back in the days of Eli. Same thing. You lost my presence then. You lost the ark. You broke the covenant. And it's happening all over again. Tingling ears? Oh yeah. You're going to hear violence and destruction all around you to the point that you become tone deaf, which is fitting since you've been tone deaf to my calls to repent. He goes on, I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish wiping it and turning it upside down. Now that's some pretty powerful imagery there. The lion and the plummet, we're talking about, you know, picture a chalk line that makes things absolutely straight. And picture a plummet where something is hanging down with a weight at the bottom to make sure that it's absolutely vertical. We're looking for straight lines. We are trying to build with compasses and squares. We're trying to align things properly. But Manasseh isn't, so fine. I will measure you by the same standard I measured Israel. They fell short. They were neither straight nor true, neither level nor straight up and down, and, and they were scattered by the Assyrians. I'm going to measure you by the, straight, the same line, and you will be destroyed in a different way by a different enemy, but same result. Picture a dish and wipe it clean, and then turn it over. And how much is it holding? Nothing. Well, the version in 2 Chronicles 33 adds a few more details. It says that because of Manasseh's wickedness, this is verse 11, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. So we're still dealing with them which took Manasseh among the thorns. There's those hooks that we talked about before. Well, Manasseh knows what it feels like to be in the nose or in the lip. They bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Babylon has not yet thrown off the Assyrian yoke. And that's where Manasseh is going to be for a time. But the story doesn't end there either. And this is where things turn into good news. So far, Manasseh has been uninterrupted bad news. But I do have to believe that something stuck from those 12 years of growing under the shadow of, of righteous Hezekiah. Hold out hope for this. Look at verse 12. When he was in affliction, Manasseh has hit rock bottom, and now he's back in contact with the rock. He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. The God of his father, we could say, who made his discipleship so clear. Manasseh prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him. He changed his mind even for Manasseh. He heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. And this is one more place where without the book of Chronicles, the book of Kings leaves us wanting. It leaves us absolutely cursing the memory of King Manasseh because he's one of the worst of the worst. If you only know Manasseh from the angle of kings, you're ready to throw, cast him off forever. But that's not the only angle. It's not his last chance or his only hope. There's a second angle here, and the chronicler saw what happened off in Babylon. And somehow Manasseh changed. 
because God was still working on him and with him. And this is one of my favorite little stories of repentance because it was, see, it was coming from someone who seemed to be the very vilest of sinners. He was. But he turned. And God turned back to him. It's amazing that God can be entreated if we'll only repent. The moment we do, he'll have mercy even upon the worst of us. And Manasseh is a beautiful example of that. Now in the aftermath of that incredible repentance, Manasseh dies. He ended on a good note, apparently. The throne passes to his son Ammon, who unfortunately grew up under the wicked king Manasseh and never chose to change when his father changed. And so Ammon rules in wickedness. He worships the graven images that his fathers set up. And according to verse 23, there in 2 Chronicles 33, he humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. That, I think, is the other side of the story we have to keep in mind. And proving the contrary is where we know that God will always be merciful, but there's also a danger to sin. Because yes, this vile sinner Manasseh changed, turned things around, came back, and life ended well for him. But it didn't go well for his son. And though Ammon wasn't punished for his father's sins, he certainly was punished by them. And the very idols that Manasseh, at his worst moments, set up, Ammon turned to, even after Manasseh had turned away from them. Elder Holland gave an amazing talk in conference years ago. I think he called it the prayer of the children. And he warned parents that as you wander, even with the intent to come back, perhaps, what is a oh, sabbatical for you might be a permanent departure for your children. So please be careful with that. That's the sad aftermath of Manasseh's story. And then Ammon, speaking of sad aftermaths, he only ruled for two years in that wickedness before some servants conspired against him. We're back to that. And they killed him. The people of Judah then round up the conspirators and kill them. They place Ammon's son Josiah on the throne. And now we're back up and running. Oh, who, which examples will we follow? But again, Manasseh's reign was 55 years. Out of two more for Ammon, there's 57 years since we had Hezekiah. In almost 60 years, do you tend to forget? Uh, do, does wickedness become pretty encrusted? And is it going to be hard to, to uproot the evil that has entered in? Well, that's going to be Josiah's mission. And he's an incredible one. He is a Hezekiah 2.0. And so he wants to be like great grandpa. And I'm glad he did. His story here appears in 2 Kings chapter 22. He takes the throne as an eight-year-old. He wasn't very old when, when dad was killed. But he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father. He turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Speaking of lions and plummets, here's one who knows how to walk the straight and narrow path unerringly. Oh, maybe he heard stories about great-grandpa. Maybe he heard stories about grandpa. Uh, and I don't want to be that. But this eight-year-old starts to change things. 18 years into his reign, so now he's 26, Josiah tells the high priest, a man named Hilkiah, to use the money that's being offered at the house of the Lord to repair all the breaches in the temple. We've seen multiple kings have to repair the temple, which means there needs to be constant fixing of things. Okay, good, Some good home maintenance. And that's true of our spirituality as well. King Hezekiah is obviously one great example of that. King Jehoash was another. And if you remember the story from, what, last week when King Jehoash was, was around, he paid the carpenters and the masons and the hewers of wood and the, and the movers of materials. Uh, the money that was coming in, they did it all faithfully. There's a great parallel between Jehoash and Josiah when it comes to that. And one other parallel, Jehoash also began to reign when he was very young. He was seven. Josiah was eight. When the Lord wants to restore things, he usually starts with a child. Think about that. But then keep reading. The Chronicles version of this, by the way, gives us an insight into that youth. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, so now he's 16, 
he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he's now twenty, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And in fact, he did that not only in Judah, his jurisdiction, but in all the places that remained up in Israel. He's like Hezekiah before him. He's getting this sense of, is there any way to reunite over these things? Now, keep these ages in mind. Age 8, he starts to reign. Age 16, he begins really seeking after the Lord his God. In 20, he begins the iconoclasm. We've got to get rid of these negative things. And then at 26, he starts bringing in the good. He's gone from justification to sanctification, just like Hezekiah did. That's a pretty good oh, chronology as far as growing up in God is concerned. We come into our own at age eight, and we're accountable now. We're on a throne of responsibility for ourselves. We still have a lot of growing up to do, though, but around 16, are we really starting to wonder what we believe and how we fit and what the answers to the big questions are? Do we begin seeking the Lord? Age 20, are we starting to really decide who we are and what matters most? And we're, this is the beginning of the decade of decision. And are we leaving behind things from the past and deciding this is the future that I want for myself? And then by 26, we're a little bit more established and I just want to become something. I want to be all that the Lord intends for me. And that's Josiah for you. But like I said, at age 26, he sends Hilkiah the priest in and, and lets them know when all the tithes and the offerings that are coming in, we've got to fix the temple. That's the most important part. And this is where the plot thickens. Verse 8, Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. I've been out there repairing things and amidst the rubble or under the dust, I, I found this. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it's simply called the book of the law. And what better place to find it than in the house of God? He who wrote that book. I've wondered, I pictured like a, a, if a temple were destroyed, heaven forbid. But someone went in to try to root through the rubble. And they found this old, dusty, white covered volume. And they pulled it out and realized, wait, this is scripture. And there it was, probably sitting on a table somewhere in the celestial room for worshipers to read. Well, it seems like no one had read a book like that for a long, long time. I mean, 60 years since great grandpa, right? What exactly is this book of the law? Scholars can't seem to agree on anything. <laughs> and so there's all kinds of possibilities here. Some say, well, book of the law, that's the Torah, that's the five books of Moses. So that's probably Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Others say, no, that's too much. Uh, the real law is Deuteronomy, the second law. And so he probably, and based on the way Josiah's reforms went, this was probably a Deuteronomistic history. And so the book of Deuteronomy is what, probably what he found. Others say, well, no, the book of Leviticus has those holiness codes. And that's really what whips you into shape. So that was probably the book of the law. And other scholars say, well, I don't know. Uh, that stuff's pretty old by then. Uh, perhaps it was other more recent prophets or reformers rewriting the law that they remember from scripture and that they had it in the temple at some, at some point. And so this is a more recent version. Take your pick. Whatever it is, the law of God is being dusted off and, and re-enthroned because it's gone from priest to messenger to king. And the king reads this and how does he react? Verse 11, it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. The ultimate sign of mourning. I realize now just how far short our society has fallen. I, I didn't realize where the standard was. We haven't seen a lion or a lion or a plummet in a long time. And there it is written right before us. And we haven't been living that way. Dad, how could you? Grandpa, how could you? I mean, I hope he got the Chronicles version of Grandpa, so at least he left him with a good taste in his mouth. But we've lost it, and we've got to regain it. So Josiah tells his advisors in verse 13, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. 
For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according to all that was written concerning us. He realizes it's not all him. We've been sinning in ignorance, but our fathers knew better. And now we do. And so what are we going to do? When you get called out or corrected or, some, or you realize an area of life where you've been falling short, how do you react? Do we humble ourselves? Do we put on sackcloth and ashes? Do we rend our clothing and, and showing it as a sign of a broken heart within? A contrite spirit on its knees, ready to ask the Lord for a second chance. In some ways, a first chance. I didn't realize, but I want to live these laws. Verse 14, so Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, Asahiah, we don't know these names, but they're worth remembering because they're part of the team that wants to change things. And where do they go? They went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college and they communed with her. Now that's about all we get to know about the background of Huldah and it's a bummer. Okay, so she's married to the guy that keeps the wardrobe. He's supposed to pass out the the priestly robes for the Levites? Okay, so this seems to at least be a man involved with sacredness, and you'd think that his wife would be similarly involved. They, she lived in the college, that's better translated as the second quarter, or the new quarter, so it's some kind of suburb, uh, just off the Temple Mount, perhaps, the, the city of David. Uh, she's a prophetess, though. That's the most important word of the verse. And she's the type of person that people go to when they need to know the will of God. That's amazing. She's a woman after all. That's some unheard of. No, it's not. Think about Deborah. Think about Jael. Think about Ruth and Naomi. Think about Hannah. Think about, we're going to meet Esther coming up. Think about Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah and Shifra and Pua and Miriam and Yocheved and Zipporah and Oh, the, the Old Testament is such a treasure trove of incredible daughters of God. And Hulda is one of them. She is recognized by others. Others that were close to the king. Why don't you talk to the king? Others that were close to, well, her own husband is like in charge of the wardrobe. Surely he's the guy that we should talk to. No, she outranks him spiritually. And he's fine with that. So let's talk to Hulda the prophetess. In verse 15, she says unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So yes, I can speak on his behalf. God's words in a little higher pitch. Tell the man that sent you to me. So yes, I'm willing to send a message back to the king. Thus saith the Lord. So God wants to speak to you as well, but he'll do it through me. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. So yes, a woman speaking for the Lord, speaking to the king, and no priesthood office required for that. Oh, sisters, I hope you know how your divine inheritance and the power and authority God has given you to receive revelation and to speak up. Who's been asking you to do that more? President Russell M. Nelson, a man with nine daughters, and a tenth child, which was finally a son. He knows the power of women. He's lived with them. Uh, and he's encouraging and urging the sisters to receive revelation from God. Go get your message, prophetess. And then speak up and share with, with bishops and state presidents. Be a vocal part of ward council. Be an equal partner with your husband at home. And even in the presiding councils of the church, more and more women's voices are being invited and heard. And I'm sure even better days ahead. Well, that was bad news from Hulda. Uh, that wickedness brings destruction. Pride Cycle would tell you that. And there's, it's going to come. But I do have some good news too. Verse 18 and 19, continuing from Hulda. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel to you, Josiah, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, sorry to keep bringing that up, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. 
So what has Huldah said there? God is aware of you, Josiah. He knows that this was a sin and ignorance on your part. And even more amazing, he knows how you reacted when your ignorance changed to knowledge. Once you became accountable, you wanted to live the life that God would have you. Your humility, your weeping, your, your tender heart. In some ways, it's not what you've done. It's how you've reacted to what you've done. And because of your tenderness, your, your sensitive conscience, I have better news for you. Verse 20, she says, Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. Thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. They brought the king word again. Your repentance, King Josiah, may not stave off the ultimate end of your kingdom. That would require your people's repentance too. And I know you're working on that. But society's problems can be only be solved by society's repentance. That's the bad news. The good news, well, it could be good news if they change. The good news for you though, Josiah, is your repentance is sparing you. And so because of your humility and faith, you will be spared the consequences of sin. And you'll die in peace. So he did. But before we get there, what does he do? Okay, I'm, I'm going to be good? F fine, but I'm a leader. I'm the king. I'm, I need to influence people to righteousness as well. So how am I going to do that? Chapter 23 of 2 Kings tells his story. Once King Josiah hears the words of Huldah the prophetess, he gathers all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem together. And in verse 2, the king went up into the house of the Lord. Best place to do it. All the men of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And what's he do once Israel has been gathered to the house of the Lord? He read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Notice when he first saw it, they called it the book of the law. What's he call it here? The book of the covenant. This is not about just transactional obedience. This is about relational faith. And it's a covenant that we're making. It's a covenant God made with our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Israel, all of you. Will you renew that covenant? Because that's what he's after. Where? It's happening at the temple. Who? Prophets, priests, people, everyone, and the Lord, since it's his house. And what? The reading of scripture and the renewal of covenant. Sounds a lot like general conference, actually. Uh, and our, will we come together? Will we gather Israel and decide we're actually going to collectively commit to the covenant with, with God? In verse 3, the king stood by a pillar. There's a good symbol of strength, of support. wonder which one he was standing next to. Yakin, meaning he will establish. Boaz, meaning in him is strength. You know, which pillar are you by? Well, it doesn't matter. He's going to be a third pillar between them. He made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, which either means to walk after him like I'm going to follow you or to walk after you like I'm going to seek you. Either way, I want to be with God. He covenanted to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. I love that phrase. Here is a communal covenant initiated by the king. This is real leadership. It's not just, I'm choosing to do this. I need you with me. And how did the people respond? They stood. They straightened up. They, they became pillars in their own right. And yes, we will do all that you have commanded. Now, in the rest of this chapter, basically from verse 4 to verse 24, it describes all the things that King Josiah did to reform religion in Judah. He's trying to destroy iniquity from among the people. So we're back to not just disapproval, but actual removal, just like Hezekiah had done. And like I said, after 60 years of pagan idolatry, there's probably going to be a lot to clean up. Well, there is. And I'm just going to fly through the chapter and bullet point list a bunch of them. In verse 4, they were, there were vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. In verse 5, there were idolatrous priests that would have to be removed. In verse 5 also, they were burning incense unto Baal, to the sun, the moon, the planets, to all the hosts of heaven. In verse 6, there was a grove 
right? In the house of the Lord. That's a problem. In verse 7, there were houses of the Sodomites, just ritual immorality, that were by the house of the Lord. So right there in the shadow of it. In verse 7, there were women out there weaving hangings for the grove. I mean, there's a whole little oh, industry going on towards idolatry. In verse 8, there were high places, figures. In verse 10, there were places where a man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Back to child sacrifice. In verse 11, there were horses that the king of Judah had given to the sun at the entering in of the house of the Lord. And there were chariots of the sun as well. You see, pagans believed that the sun was carried across the sky in a chariot of fire. So, I mean, if we're going to worship the sun, we better have some good horses in a stable right by the temple. And we'll have some chariots of gold to make it look all the better. In verse 12, there were altars set up on the king's rooftop. That's where sin often happens. Ask David about that one. Uh, but also in the temple courts themselves. And if that's not bad enough, verse 13, there was a place called the Mount of Corruption. Oh, nothing. Let's, let's be subtle here, shall we? And it's the place that Solomon built for all of his pagan wives to worship corruptible gods. You can kind of sum it all up with verse 24. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits, and the wizards, and the images, and the idols, and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. <laughs> spied, you can just see them everywhere. Did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord? This is a reform and an iconoclasm on the level of King Hezekiah before him. And bless Josiah for doing it. He is going to be remembered as one of the greatest kings of, of divided Israel for this reformation. And how did it begin? I found scripture. I dusted it off in my life. When my wife turned things around after five years of total inactivity and being as far away from God as she could get, that was age 15 to 20, the first step back, well, beyond some incredible unconditional love from a recently returned missionary brother. The first real steps for her was dusting off the Book of the Law, in her case, the Book of Mormon. And she has never allowed it to collect dust since. And it's made her one of the great disciples that I will always be grateful to be permanently connected to. It's amazing what happens. Think about John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word. That describes a lot of things. And if you want to reform your life, if you want to clean things out, if you want the motivation to do so, then dust off your scriptures. I know I'm speaking to the choir. There's no, you don't have time to, to have any dust on them. You're in them hours and hours and hours a week. Bless you for that. Well, how did this cleansing take place? Let me fly through the chapter again, just pointing out some of the things Josiah did to eliminate all these things. Back in verse 4, for example, those pagan vessels that were in the temple, he removed them and burned them without Jerusalem, so outside the city, in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Now, again, I told you earlier, anytime you see the word Kidron, you've got to think Gethsemane. You've got to think atonement. And what better place to burn down these false gods than right there at the feet of Christ but also carrying the ashes to Bethel. Oh yeah, Bethel, that's up in Israel, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that's where, that's where Je Jeroboam I initiated idolatry in Israel with his golden calf. In fact, golden calves, think about Aaron and what had Moses done with the golden calf to reform the people? He ground it down, he burned it. He ground it down into powder. Then he made him drink it. Hmm, yikes. Uh, but in this case, Let's burn it. Let's grind it down. Let's put it in the fields of Kidron. Let's take the ash to Bethel, which means house of God. Huh. That's, that's good. To bring it. Because what does God do with ash? Isaiah will tell us he turns ashes into beauty. That's a great metaphor for repentance. Or how about this one? Verse 6. When he takes the grove out of the temple, he burned it at the brook Kidron. He stamped it small to powder. He cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. Again, sound like golden calf? And put it on the graves. Let, well, let's join spiritual death, at least its remains, with physical death, at least its remains, since the two go hand in hand. 
We want life, not death. And the atonement of Christ overcomes both. So we've got a clean house on this. How about this in verse 12? He broke down the pagan altars and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. There it is again. And that river will empty it out to the sea of death itself. Throughout these verses, Josiah is repeatedly described as defiling the sites of pagan worship. Defiling them. Well, let the punishment fit the crime. These were places where people defiled themselves with false worship. So might as well defile those places. But the irony here, too, is in a way sort of fighting fire with fire or maybe using their superstitions to stop their own superstitions. Or maybe I can put it this way. You can use their own worldview to change their worldview. You've got to work within it. I think too often we come from the outside and try to fight it, but it's like, no, no, no. We're, we're in two different mental universes. Ah, okay, then let me enter yours and see what material I can use to help you decide to change your ways. I need to come to understand where you're coming from. And so what kinds of things would these people consider defiling? Well, one of them was death. Everybody kind of sees death as a scary thing. And so what do you do with cemeteries? And cemeteries are interesting because on the one hand, they're places of great holiness because think of the spirit. But they're also a place of... of I mean, that's what Halloween is made of, right? Uh, cemetery, go graveyard stories, because it's also a place of death and decay. The, is the spirit there? Is the d d dying body there? Ooh, is this a holy place or an unclean place? The answer is yes. And through much of Jewish tradition, cemeteries are viewed from both of those angles as well. A place of holiness. Some consider them second only to the synagogue. And others, on the other side, a place of uncleanness because of the decay that's taking place. So what does he do? Verse 14, when he cut down the groves, he filled their places with the bones of men. Let's turn this thing into a cemetery. That'll scare people away from it. That's one way to, I mean, the groves keep growing back. So let's do the, make it different. Verse 16, as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar, upon a pagan one. That way he polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Now, wait, what are you talking about? How does that verse end? Do you remember long enough ago when Jeroboam first starts setting up idolatry in Bethel? And this unnamed prophet from Judah comes in and sees him and says, Oh, I've got a message for this altar here, this pagan altar you've set up. I mean, if you want to listen in, uh, that's fine. I, I don't mind your eavesdropping. But then he prophesies that this altar will someday be broken. And in fact, that the bones of wickedness will be burned upon this wicked altar. Fighting evil with evil, I suppose. And that's exactly what's happening in Josiah's reign. In fact, verse 17, Josiah says, wait, 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 what title is this that I see? We're going through all these sepulchers to pull out their bones, but there's a, a name on this one. Who's laid to rest there? And the men of the city told him, Oh, it's the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. Like, what? wait, the, the very guy we were talking about? Uh, the exact person that's, that was prophesying that this would take place? Whoa, there's a coincidence that isn't coincidental. I mean, back in 1 Kings 13, 2, where he begins speaking to the altar, listen to how specific his prophecy was. O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David. How old was Josiah? He was only eight when he started this. Oh, let's even be more specific than that. Josiah by name. I'll be that crystal clear. And upon thee, you altar, shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Wow. Prophecy fulfilled. Go on in verse 18, back to our original story. When they found the old prophet's bones, Josiah said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone. Oh, if anyone deserves to rest in peace, it's the prophet who got it so right as far as that prophecy was concerned. In fact, I guess I'm just finishing his work since that's what he was trying to do so long ago. In verse 20, he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. 
got a bit of Elijah in him, but did exactly as that old prophet from Judah had said. Now, one more act of purification here. In verse 21 and 2, the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God. I told you that Josiah was Hezekiah 2.0. As it is written in the book of this covenant, so let's do it by the book as we should. Surely there was not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. I mean, we got to read more in depth the detail about Hezekiah's celebration. And the fact that this one even topped that one, wow. Maybe it's a good thing he didn't spell it all out or we'd be here all day. But that was the legacy of King Josiah. Absolute reform and restoration. Let's get back to the original. Let's get back to God where this all began. And where did that all start? It started with repentance. A pricked conscience when a book of scripture was read in his ears and everything changes. It's amazing the influence that a good person can have. In verse 25, like unto him, there was no king before him that turned, there's our repentance word, to the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Now I emphasize the heart and soul, but added the might there because heart and soul can be personal. Might is often uh, equated with influence. I have might, I can show power, I can get things done. And one of the great things about Josiah is that he used that influence, his might, to turn people to God right along with him. Now, I wish that that were the end of the story for his people. I wish we could just say, and they lived happily ever after, and leave it at that. However, verse 26 and 7 change things. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Now what we're seeing here is more scattering, just like Israel. Until Israel is lost, though a remnant shall return, Jerusalem will be destroyed, this time by the Babylonians. The temple will will be destroyed. That's tragic. And for them to realize this, yes, your repentance will save those who repent. But unless it is sufficiently widespread, there will not be societal salvation. And heap it all on Manasseh? But I thought he changed. Well, he did in the Chronicles account. Is this just the king's account, not knowing about the change? Maybe. Then again, it might be not just what Manasseh did, but the fact that the people let him, the fact that people went along with it, when they had lived in the reign of Hezekiah, they knew better. And did we just go with the flow and go along with wicked Assyria or wicked Babylon or wicked Manasseh? And do we stay wicked even when Manasseh change back, changes back to righteous? Social problems here, and it's going to be a social collective consequence. Well, by the end of the chapter, the Egyptians have now attacked the Assyrians, world superpowers at, uh, in, in a fight. And like I said before, if you're caught in the middle of the fist fight, you're going to get a black eye or worse. And Josiah sadly gets the worst. He's killed in a battle. He goes out to fight against Pharaoh. And sadly, Josiah, you didn't have to. This wasn't your, he wasn't picking a bone with you. This wasn't your war to wage. In the Chronicles version, chapter 35, verse 21 and 2, Pharaoh warned him, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war, namely the Assyrians. For God commanded me to make haste. Forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him. And in that unnecessary battle, Josiah was killed. And thus ends his reign in a way that it didn't have to. Maybe this is a good illustration of choosing your battles. He chose so many of the right ones and he fought them well. This was one that he didn't have to be involved in. But with him gone, his son Jehoahaz takes the throne. 
He rules in wickedness. We seem to be going bouncing back and forth in Judah between righteousness and wickedness. He ends up undoing all the good his father had done. Pharaoh, who had said some nice things about Josiah, realizes your son is not worth preserving. And so he imprisons him back in Egypt where he died. He puts Judah to tribute. He installs a different son of Josiah on the throne. His name is Eliakim, but I guess Pharaoh doesn't like that name, and calls him Jehoiakim instead. Sorry for the confusion, no quiz at the end. Jehoiakim means established by God, which means either Pharaoh was really prideful, and since I put you in place, and since I'm God, then Jehoiakim, you are established by me, or he's just thinking, I want the people to think that God is behind this, so they'll just keep the peace and be and, and follow my little puppet ruler, okay? Just call him Jehoiakim. But he, as well, rules in wickedness, taxes the people heavily to keep Pharaoh uh, occupied or happy, and thus ends chapter 23. Now, 24, the worst news comes. Verse 1, in his days, the days of wicked Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up. And Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now, you may not know Jehoiakim, but you probably do know Nebuchadnezzar. And it's the Babylonians this time. Enough generations have passed. Hezekiah with a long rule, Manasseh with a long rule, Josiah with a long rule. We're now getting closer and closer to the destruction of Jerusalem in 600 B.C. The destruction of the northern king by the Assyrians was about 721, give or take. And so this 120 years have passed. We're getting closer and closer to Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Lehi, and Nebuchadnezzar is on the throne. And it's the throne of Babylon. The Assyrian Empire lasted roughly from 900 BC to about 600 BC. But as we already saw, Babylon's on the rise and Assyria's on the wane by now. And now Babylon's in charge. So Nebuchadnezzar comes and... Jehoiakim doesn't like it. He turns and rebels against him, and maybe it was the timing of it all. A new man on the throne, new empire in charge. If there was ever a chance to make a break for it, let's do it right now. Well, not wise, especially when Babylon isn't your only enemy. In verse 2, the Lord sent against Jehoiakim bands of the Chaldees, bands of the Syrians, bands of the Moabites, bands of the children of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Enemies on every side, but the enemy was, the real one anyway, was within. Jehoiakim, you're not righteous. You haven't hearkened to the words of the prophets, so you're not heeding the word of God, so God can't be with you. No wonder everyone's against you. Those that be against us are more than those that be with us, because God isn't with us at all. When Jehoiakim then dies, he's succeeded by his son Jehoiakim. Sorry for the similarity in names here. But Jehoiakim is no different than Jehoiakim, and he reigns in wickedness as well. During his reign, the Babylonian army comes. They lay siege to Jerusalem until Judah surrenders. Oh, not even Hezekiah's tunnel could save them from this destruction. And in verse 13, he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Oh, remember Hezekiah's mistake? He showed them all. And generations later, they, but the Babylonians came back, knowing enough of the lay of the land and oh, salivating over the riches that had been told them and now it's all back in Babylon with them. In verse 14, he carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives, all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained, save the poorest sort of the people of the land. Ah, those ones, let's not even worry about it. They're not going to be strong or wise or valiant enough to take us on. Well, just let them stay. It's kind of like the Assyrians. Let enough uh, Israelites stay up north that... They understand the manner of the God of the land. Well, let the poor go. Like I said, the Assyrian game plan was shuffle the deck or play 52-card pickup. The Babylonian game plan was let's take those leaders with the highest potential. People like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's take the best of the best, and we'll even include their craftsmen and smiths so that nobody can even make armor or weapons back home. 
Let's take their princes. Let's take their mighty men of valor. And let's bring them to Babylon. Now, on the one hand, this might sound like a bad idea. Uh, I mean, we're going to bring them into the, the heart of our empire. Do, isn't that dangerous? Uh, no, we have enough confidence and we have enough strength. to. <laughs> they're not going to rebel right here at home. In fact, I think rather than rebel, they will relent. They'll be they won't be angry. They'll be in awe. They'll come and look at the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world. They'll see the, the strength and sophistication of our civilization. I mean, if King Ahaz was amazed by the fashion and patterns of little Syria, come to Babylon and you'll be blown away. You'll want to worship our gods. You'll want to change your names to reflect that. You'll want to listen to our music and eat our food, all things that we'll see in the book of Daniel. What's the game plan? We're trying to Babylonify you. Because if we can make you little versions of us, you need to be loyal to us instead of loyal to your homeland. You'll never rebel. You've joined your captors. You've captivated yourself. Sound like the Babylonian game plan in our day? You better believe it but it's happened right here. In fact, verse 16 adds to the list earlier, all the men of might and all that were strong and apt for war. Oh yeah, we can't have you fighting against us. Let's change your mentality and then you'll fight for us. Then verse 17, the king of Babylon made Mataniah his father's brother. That's not Nebuchadnezzar's father's brother. That is Jehoiakim's father's brother. He made him king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now, you fans of the Book of Mormon should remember that name. Ooh, this is when Zedekiah is on the throne. That's when Lehi leaves. Exactly. And who was Zedekiah? Well, he was Jehoi Jehoiakim's uncle, which makes him another son of Josiah, which means he should have known better because he was raised in righteousness, but unfortunately he ruled in wickedness. He ends up rebelling against Babylon, but he turns to Egypt for help. And sure enough, that's that rotten reed that's going to pierce your own hand. And yes, he is unsuccessful in that rebellion, which then leaves us with one final chapter, chapter 25, to see the aftermath of this rebellion against Babylon. You don't want to get on their bad side. We already saw that he'd carried away all of these people to Jerusalem. We already saw that he carried away the treasures of the temple and everywhere else. But in chapter 25, we see it all come crashing down. We're nine years into Zedekiah's reign. The Babylonians come to attack Jerusalem. They besiege the city for two years until there's no more food for the people to eat. By then, so weakened on the inside, they can't really defend themselves. And the Babylonians breach the walls just as Zedekiah and his family, seeing there's no hope for them, they flee. Oh, not, this is no captain going down with the ship. This is every man for himself, and he's the first to run. He leaves the people to, def to fend for themselves, but he can't f fend for himself because Zedekiah is caught during his escape, and he's brought before the king of Babylon. Now, verse 7, how are you going to respond to this oh, unfaithful king? They slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And then they put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. Well, fetters of brass might be better than the hooks of the Assyrians. But to put your eyes out when the last thing you've seen was the death of your own sons? That's intense. Talk about a, a memory to be seared into the mind. Now that's the end of Zedekiah and the end of his line because his sons have been slain before him. Well, not all of them. And this is where the Book of Mormon adds this detail. Helaman chapter 8, verse 21. And now will you dispute that Jerusalem was destroyed? I mean, that happened a long time ago, almost 600 years. And how do the Nephites know for sure? Well, will you say that the sons of Zedekiah were not slain, all except it were Mulek? Yea, and do ye not behold that the seed of Zedekiah are with us, and they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem? Evidently, there was one son unnamed in the Bible, but a man named Mulek who escaped successfully. 
And that was good for them, for him. His descendants then ended up crossing the ocean and coming to the New World around the same time as Lehi. They landed in different places, and it wasn't until generations later that they finally come together and realize, whoa, we have a common story. And the, the split lines have reconverged. It actually also helps explain the king men, some have suggested in the Book of Mormon, who thought that they had right to the throne oh, rather than the kings of the Nephites or the chief judges or anything else. Well, how would they come out with that impression? Well, if they're descendants of Mulek, son of King Zedekiah, of the tribe of Judah, and the scepter shall not pass from the, the tribe of Judah, Oh, you Lehite Manassehites, oh no, you should bow to your proper king, the king men, descendants of Mulek, most likely. Well, back to the old, the old world, the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar then sends the captain of his guard to Jerusalem. And in verse 9, he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. This is the final and most devastating loss of all. The destruction of the city. The collapse of every wall that would keep out worldly influences. I mean, I guess in some ways they'd broken down their own walls metaphorically long before. But as the Babylonians and Chaldeans come pouring in, with the people of Judah pouring out fire everywhere, destroying every great man's house, and worst of all, destroying the house of the greatest one of all. And the temple is no more. They've lost everything. But specifically in that passage, three things that will be most important to rebuild, and that will prepare us for next week. You have to rebuild the city a sacred space where you can live your life and try to turn it over to God. You have to rebuild the wall because that is what marks off your sacred space. This is the sanctuary of standards. These are the confines of covenant. This is protection. And third, you've got to rebuild the house of the Lord. You've got to center that life within this rebuilt city, in this rebuilt, on this rebuilt temple. That's what walls are, are meant to protect to create this sacred space with sacredness itself at its center. We'll see all of that next week. But here, as part of the destruction of the temple, the Babylonians also break down the bronze pillars. There goes Joachim and Boaz. They bring the metal back to Babylon to do whatever they want with it. Verse 14 and 15, that's not it. The pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the spoons, all the vessels of brass wherewith they ministered took they away. The fire pans, the bowls, such things as were of gold, in gold, of silver, in silver, the, cut, the captain of the guard took away. I add that verse simply because of its list of objects that it describes with the vessels. Because when Isaiah, near the end of his ministry, will say, be clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord, that's what he's talking about. The day will come where you can return to the holy city and make it holy again. The day will come where you can rebuild yourselves in order to rebuild the house of God. But to do so, you must become a worthy temple if you ever hope to build a worthy temple and that requires cleanliness, worthiness. So if you're planning on going back to Jerusalem and burying the vessels of the temple that were brought into Babylon with you, be clean, as clean as you want the temple to be. With that, we end our story. But throughout all these ups and downs of history this week, God kept sending prophets to cry repentance. That's why I want to end with the Chronicles version of this demise rather than the King's version. In 2 Chronicles 36 verse 15, the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes, which means early or promptly or right on cue, and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God never gave up on his children. That's why he flooded the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom with so many prophets at their time of imminent destruction. Speaking of crazy names from prophet Isaiah, that's another name of one of his kids, Mahershalal Hashbaz. The destruction is imminent, speed to the spoil. 
It's right here. And I'm living my life and naming my children in hopes that you will change. In the next verse, 16, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. That's the phrase that sums up all we've studied this week. Till there was no remedy. But isn't there always a remedy? Well, yes, if we'll just use it. Here's the medicine, just take it before it's too late. And the remedy is repentance. It's reformation and restoration. It's all that we've seen Hezekiah do and Josiah do. Open the doors of your temple. Let the light shine in. Bring out the filthiness. Destroy it in the, in the Kidron. Let Christ come and heal you. That is constantly the call of prophets. Turn, soften your stiff neck, and come unto Christ. My friends, it's usually the wicked who mock and despise the words of prophets, but I worry for you and me that among the faithful, even we sometimes misuse them. And what I mean by that is, what's God's ultimate use for a prophet? I think even more than crying repentance. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who publish peace, who saith, thy God reigneth, we're trying to establish Zion. We want to be on the, on the second half, not the first, the sanctification, not the justification. They're trying to make us holy, not just to get us to clean up our act, but if we're still stuck in the first stage and prophets find themselves constantly, great, I still have to cry repentance? I always thought about this with Elder Richard G. Scott because it seemed like every talk he gave was about repentance. And I knew he had a lot more to talk about than just that. And I wondered, it'd be so interesting if we actually repented. What would he talk about? I'd love to know. I'd love to let him use everything God has given him. All of his faith, all of his testimony, all of his prophecy and seership and revelation. Let's use the prophets in the way they were meant to be used. As they point us to better places. I'm grateful for them. I testify of their inspiration. I'm grateful for a Hezekiah at the helm right now in Russell M. Nelson. It's amazing to see as he is challenging us to learn to hear the Lord and receive personal revelation and sweep out the debris from our lives and strengthen our foundations and let God prevail in our lives as we build spiritual momentum in coming unto him really as we gather Israel. We saw it scattered today. And if the Spirit has tugged at your heart at all to bemoan their fate, then do something about it. As I was pondering these things and realizing the northern kingdom is scattered to the wind, the southern kingdom is, is dragged off into captivity in Babylon, I couldn't, stop but, I couldn't help but hear Mormon lamenting in my mind, what he said at the end of his civilization, O ye fair ones, how could ye have departed from the ways of the Lord? O ye fair ones, how could ye have rejected that Jesus who stood with open arms to receive you? That's why we're gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. My prayer for all of us is that we can say to a scattered people and a wandering, wandering world, Come unto Christ. He has open arms to receive you.